Recall from your introductory chemistry course that orbitals in atoms, the atomic orbitals, follow a well-defined pattern of energies from lowest to highest, specifically 1s is lowest, followed by 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, etc. And since we're not going to be dealing with transition metals, we don't need to worry about the d orbitals, and in fact most of the molecules we'll see will live in this territory at the n equals 2 level and below since we'll be dealing with first and second row elements. We generate the electron configuration of an atom by filling up these levels with the number of electrons that the atom contains. So here's the configuration for hydrogen, for helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, for example. Let's take a moment to review the shapes of the atomic orbitals by looking at them in the context of the ethane molecule. Here's the ethane molecule, and I've overlaid the 1s orbital on carbon on top of this carbon here. We should notice that the orbital is quite compact. It's very close to the sphere that represents the carbon atom, and it's spherical. The probability distribution of the electrons in this orbital is spherical in shape. If we now move to the 2s orbital, we see that there's a considerable increase in the size of the orbital, although it maintains its spherical shape. And although you can't see it in this figure, there's a node at the center of the orbital as well. There's a change in sign that occurs inside the 2s orbital. 2s orbital on carbon is getting so large that it's starting to interpenetrate the other carbon atom, which suggests that it's important for bonding, and it absolutely is. This is one of the valence orbitals of carbon. The 2p orbitals are directional and consist of two lobes, one of one sign and one of the opposite sign on opposite sides of the atom. So they form kind of a dumbbell shape. And they're directional and point along axes that correspond to the x, y, and z axes. Put another way, carbon has two other p orbitals at right angles to this one, here and here. And notice that one of them points along the axis between the nuclei and the other two are perpendicular to this orbital. Like the 2s orbital, the 2p orbital is large enough in shape to engage in bonding with the hydrogens and with the other carbon atom. And so it too is going to be an important player in the bonding of this carbon with other atoms in organic molecules. One of the problems we run into when thinking about using these valence atomic orbitals for bonding in organic molecules is that the orientations of the orbitals don't line up with the atomic positions, which we can verify through other means. So for example, you can see that this p orbital isn't really well aligned to engage in bonding with either of these two hydrogens, and it's even not ideal for bonding with this hydrogen, which is at a slight angle. To account for the geometries we actually see in organic molecules and to make localized molecular orbitals easier to build later, we use a device called the hybrid atomic orbital. And these are superpositions of the atomic orbitals on a single atom. In essence, we take some of the s orbital at an atom, we add up some of the three p orbitals, one, two, or three of them, or even fractional numbers of them, as we'll see later, and out pops a combined atomic orbital that makes sense in light of the geometries we actually observe. The number of electron pair domains around an atom, not counting those involved in resonance, as we've already seen, determines the hybridization of that atom. So for example, the tetrahedral building block always has sp3 hybridization. We see sp2 hybridization with three electron pair domains around the atom, sp hybridization with two electron pair domains around the atom. So the number of electron pair domains determines the hybridization. Let's look now at the shapes of the hybrid orbitals in ethane. Because each of the carbons in ethane bears four electron pair domains, three CH bonds and one CC bond, we can identify the hybridization of each carbon as sp3. And the shape of a typical sp3 hybrid is shown for you here. They look kind of like elongated p orbitals with more density on one side than the other. And we get this density enhancing effect on one side because the p and s orbitals reinforce one another on this side and actually cancel or interfere with one another on the other side, leading to a sort of lobe or what one of my old professors referred to as a little nub on the back side of the hybrid orbital. And notice again that this hybrid is interpenetrating the other carbon, so it's going to be very important for bonding. As we'll see in a bit, overlapping of the hybrids produces the localized molecular orbitals that we're going to identify in bonds within organic structures. We also see hybrids aligned along the bonds to the hydrogens, and these also participated in bonding 
by overlapping with 1s orbitals on the hydrogen atoms. The ethylene molecule shown here contains a double bond between the central carbon atoms and is lacking two of the hydrogens in ethane. Because each carbon bears only three electron pair domains in this molecule, its hybridization is sp2. What we can see by looking at the shape of the sp2 hybrid is that the basic shape is very similar. We have kind of an elongated p orbital with one lobe larger and the little nub a little bit smaller. The sp2 orbital is actually a little bit more compact. This is somewhat difficult to tell, but I think is a little bit easier to see in the smaller lobe of the two, which is a little bit smaller than it is in the sp3 case. We find two more sp2 hybrids pointing to each of the hydrogen atoms on each carbon atom. And because we only use two of the p orbitals, an unhybridized p orbital perpendicular to the plane of the molecule remains on each carbon atom. These are the inputs to the pi bonding and anti bonding molecular orbitals of the molecule. Finally, for completeness, let's look at the molecule ethyne, which contains a triple bond between the two carbon atoms. Each carbon in ethyne has two electron pair domains, and so the hybridization at each carbon is sp. And what we can see in looking at the shape is it once again has the typical elongated p orbital shape with one large lobe and one smaller lobe. And this orbital really drives the point home that as we add s character to the hybrid, as we take p orbitals away, the orbital gets more compact. That said, this hybrid still completely swallows this other carbon atom, indicating that it's very important for bonding. This is going to overlap a great deal with the sp hybrid on the other carbon. The hybrid atomic orbitals are linear combinations of the atomic orbitals. This is just a fancy way of saying that we take a little bit of the s orbital on an atom, a little bit of the p, px, py, and pz, and add them together to produce each of the hybrids. But this has profound implications, just like the idea that the true structure of a molecule is a linear combination of its resonance structures that we saw in the section on resonance. One of the important implications has to do with the energies of the hybrids. If we lay down the 2s atomic orbital and the 2p atomic orbitals on an energy diagram, we can position the hybrid orbitals on this diagram just by considering the percentage s and p within each hybrid. So for example, if we start with the sp3 hybrids, because these are 25% s and 75% p just based on the coefficients in the name sp3, the energy is 75% of the way from s to p. This is the energy of an sp3 hybrid. Likewise, because the sp2 orbital is 33% s now and 67% p, again just based on these coefficients in the name, the energy of an sp2 hybrid is 66% of the way between the 2s and 2p orbital energies. And finally, because the sp hybrid is 50% s and 50% p, the sp hybrid orbital is halfway between the energies of the 2s and 2p orbitals. We're going to see this trend again, but I just want to note briefly here that what we can conclude from this is that sp3 electrons are higher in energy than sp2 electrons, which are higher in energy than sp electrons. This is a very important conclusion that we're going to return to in later discussions of stability trends.